the news. Uh, this lecture notes for this lecture are already there on the on the website. Uh, tutorial as well, and maybe you have already seen that the next homework, homework number three, is also already out. Uh, the deadline is in three weeks minus one day. Um, so it's, I think, Thursday, 28th of, uh, of November. Yes? And the topic of the homework is uh, generalized coloring numbers. So the topic that we'll be talking about today. So I get that the last week. No, two weeks ago, you started uh, working with general coloring numbers, and Martin gave a lecture introducing the concept and proving basic facts. Uh, so we will now continue with this and start to give uh, some uh, nice applications of, uh, of these uh, this structural measures. So let me start simply with some, um, with some uh, recollection of uh, reminder of, of uh, what these, these numbers were. So essentially, the, the general correct numbers can be seen as um, as uh, generalization of the concept of the generate. Yeah, in the generate, you had an ordering of my graph where every vertex was seeing only a bounded number of of neighbors that were preceding him in this order. In, uh, in, in this order, and now instead of see, looking at distance only one, so neighbors at distance one that are preceding in the order, we are looking at neighbors at uh, larger distance. Yeah, but now you want to understand what does it mean a neighbor at a larger distance. So when you think about it, there are three possible ways of defining it, and these three ways uh, give rise to the three natural uh, notions of, of, of generalized current numbers. Yeah, so the idea is that if I have a graph G, I've got some radius R, so this is the distance that I am interested in, and I've got some sigma is a uh, sigma is a linear order on uh, the vertex set, yes? Then I can define what does it mean that a vertex reaches some other earlier vertex uh, via a short path, yes? So if I have a here the order, here I've got some vertex, say, V, and here I've got some vertex U, and I've got an assumption that U is earlier in the order than V, then I say that u is weakly reachable at a distance r from v, yeah, in the order sigma in the graph g, yes. If there is a path of length at most r, of length at most r, let me draw it first. Yes? So the path starts in V, it goes like that, and finally it reaches U. Yes? But the rule is that the path should go from V to U, yes? That is always above U. Yeah? So U should be the smallest vertex on this path, right? Good. I'm just recalling what was, what was there. Before, because uh, these definitions of the weak coloring numbers and strong coloring numbers may appear strange at the beginning, but then they get uh, they get more and more natural every time you you hear them. Yes. Uh, okay, so this is weak reachability. For strong reachability, the path should behave like that: that here is V, here is U, yes, and the path looks like that. It starts in V, it goes only above V. And then finally it jumps to u. Yes? So here we say that u is in strong reachability set at distance r. Yes? And finally we had this notion of admissibility. So this is strong reachability. And finally, we had this notion of admissibility or distance r admissibility. Admissibility. This is how you write it. There should be some double s somewhere here. Okay, never mind. Um, and here, instead of saying that I'm able to reach some number of vertices that are below, I'm actually thinking of a slightly different object. If I have a vertex v here, I'm thinking how many paths 
I can draw that are vertex disjoint from V to the part that is below V. Yes? So say that I can, for example, draw such a path, then maybe another path like that, and maybe another path like that, and so on. So the admissibility at the distance R of vertex V is the maximum cardinality of a set of paths P such that P are distance uh, have length at most R, that's for sure. Second, connect V with lower vertices. Yes, yeah, so vertices are lower in the order, yes, and are disjoint. Yeah, of course, disjoint apart from sharing the vertex V that they started, right? Good. So these were the three notions of reaching the set of smaller vertices from a vertex, and based on that, we defined this general coloring numbers. So the weak coloring number at distance r of some order is just the maximum weak reachability set, cardinality of our weak reachability set over all vertices v, yes? And the weak coloring number of a graph, yes, is just the minimum over all possible linear orderings of the vertex set of the, of the weak coloring number. Right? So this is this uh, classic idea of, uh, in, in structural graph theory that we have a notion of the composition, which in our case is a linear order. We have the notion of the width of the composition, which is just the size of the largest weak reachability set, and then the uh, the parameter of a graph is just the best possible width of the composition. Yes? Good. So if we have this, this idea about the weak coloring number, we can define the same for the strong coloring number. This is just the maximum over all vertices B of the strong reachability set. Yes? And the same. And the same for admissibility, yeah? And then you had this nice, uh, during the last lecture, we were proving uh, the nice bounds between these three things, yes? That actually they're all functionally uh, depending on each other, yes? So, so the fact is that the weak coloring number is the largest, okay, so the admissibility is the smallest, the strong coloring number is here, then this is bounded by the weak coloring number, and in turn this is bounded by some function of R and admissibility R of genes. Yes, this was some admissibility to the power roughly R squared. This is what we proved. Yes, so all these things are bounded. Yes. And then there was this, this, this fundamental theorem about this, that boundedness of these generous coloring numbers, yes, they exactly characterize classes of bounded expansion. So the following conditions, so let's see be a class of graphs. Yes, and the following uh, conditions are equivalent, yes? First of all, that C has bounded expansion. Yeah. Second, that I say admissibility is bounded. Yes. So for every radius that I look at, yes, if I look at the admissibility of the members of my class, they, there is a finite upper bound on the admissibility, yes? So this admissibility R of a graph class, this is just a shorthand for the supremum over all members of the class. 
Yes? And same for the strong coloring number. And same for the weak color. Yes? So now in the proof of this theorem, we did not prove this theorem fully last time, and today the first thing that we will do, we will finish this proof. So first of all, the equivalence of 2, 3, and 4, yes, this is just a trivial corollary of this fact. Yes? Because if one is bounded, then the others are also bounded because they are functionally dependent on each other. Yes? Then the there was a proof during the last lecture that uh, now which one will uh, imply which. I think that 4 implies 1. And for this we proved the following fact that if I look at the density of r shallow minors of a graph G, then this is always upper bounded Yes, by the weak coloring number at distance 4 r plus 1. Yes, there was a proof of this fact during the last lecture, right? You can say yes. Yes. Yes, yes. good, thanks. Uh, good. So this is implication. If these numbers are bounded, then these numbers are bounded as well, and the class has bounded first. Yes? Uh, so we are left with implication from 1 to 4, yes? That will be proved now. So this was already, I think, noted during the, the, last, the last lecture that the following theorem is true, or maybe let's call it a theorem or a lemma, maybe a theorem. Yes? That admissibility R of a graph is always, so for every graph G and for every R, yes, is always upper bounded by, uh, I think that the expression was, this is a bit ugly expression, I'm not that happy with that, but let's try to live with it. Yeah, so 1 plus 6R times the density of top, shallow topological minus at depth r minus 1, yes, to the power cube, yeah? Of course, observe that the density of topological minors is upper bounded by the density of standard minors because every distance r minus 1, depth r minus 1 topological minor is also a depth r minus 1 minor, yes? So this, in particular, gives you the sort of a reverse uh, implication. So in particular, this theorem will prove implication actually, um, this will be implication 1 to 2, right? Boundedness of, uh, of graphs implies boundedness of admissibility numbers, right? Uh, just, uh, I just forgot, in this definition, um, well, in this definition it depends uh, how, you, how you like it. Actually in the notes, and I think that uh, we follow this convention during this course, that we add one here. We write one plus this, just because when you add this one, some of the bounds become, become nicer, and also admissibility, strong reachability, and uh, weak which a uh, strong coloring number and weak coloring number then collapse to the generacy plus one all for distance one. Yes. So this is one plus one. Uh, good. So we now prove this theorem. Yeah. Okay, so two weeks ago during the tutorials you already have seen some algorithm, actually an optimum algorithm that computes the, the, the admissibility of a graph, yes? This was kind of a greedy algorithm that computes the, um, the, or, the order from right to left, always taking the, the vertex with sort of the, the best possible admissibility, yeah? So the idea is as follows. So 
suppose that my graph, I have a graph G, yes, I've got this R, which is an integer, and I would like to produce some order of, of this graph, and I construct it from right to left, yes? So I have already ordered some vertices, say, vi plus 1, vi plus 2, up to vn, yes? So I start with having vn, then vn minus 1, and so on, vi plus 1, and still there is a blob of vertices that should be placed here, but not, are not yet ordered. Yes? I will call it SI, which is just the vertex set minus the guys that are already ordered. Yes? And now I would like to understand which vertex from those you have to take at the next VI. Yes? So suppose you take one vertex from here. Yes? Oh, that's actually the same color. And you think, if I place this guy, say, he, let's call, it, call him V. Yes? How, what will be the admissibility of this vertex if I, if I place him as the next vi plus 1? Yes? Then this number, yes, will be the, well, essentially what I wrote here. Yes? 1 plus the maximum size of a family P. Yes? So that P is a family of paths of paths such that the length is at most r, yes, uh, second, uh, they are disjoint, apart from sharing v, yes, and moreover they lead from v to back to this si, yes, through uh, avoiding SI. Yes? So each such path should go, start from V, go a bit here, through the vertices that are ordered, and then jump back to, to SI. Yes? And the next one can go like this and jump back to the next guy. Yes? And they should be disjoint. Yes? This will be the admissibility of this vertex if he is placed as vi. Yeah. So, so what our algorithm is doing, it is just take, so let br of uh, say vertex v on a set s be this maximum cardinality of P such that blah, 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 blah. This is exactly what is written here. Yes? And we, the algorithm is just always take the I as the vertex of SI with smallest this, let's call it the back reachability. Yes? V, S, I. Is the algorithm clear? And actually during the uh, tutorials we proved that this algorithm achieves optimum admissibility. Yes? We will not prove, we will not need this fact here. The only fact that we will need in this kind of a trivial claim is that if during the course of this algorithm, I've got, I only experience back reachability at most L, then the admissibility of this ordering that we get is at most L, uh, L plus 1. Right? Yeah? If I only experience back, the back reachability uh, L, then back connectivity L, then the admissibility is bounded by, by, by what I got. Yeah? Good. So, in order to prove that this algorithm produces a good ordering, yes, we want to prove the, the following claim, that uh, this, throughout the algorithm, throughout, this is a difficult word, the algorithm, 
this back connectivity, or yeah, back connectivity, let's call it, yes, is always bounded by L, which is this, this funny number. 6R D cube, where let's write D for the shortcut for this, as a shortcut for this, for this top number, for this top graph. Yes? If we prove this, then we are done. So in fact, what I will what I will prove is the following lemma. I will state the lemma and then we will see that actually this lemma trivially implies this claim. So suppose that I've got uh, a graph G and R and D are integers. Yes. And in S, in G, there is a subset of vertices of S such that the following condition holds BR of VS is larger than L, which is exactly this number here, for all V from S. Then what I claim is that in G, there is a depth R minus 1 topological minor of density, of edge density, larger than D. Yes? So I claim that if I have such a set S, which is like a counterexample for this claim, yes, where all the back connectivities of every vertex of S that I could possibly pick are large, yes, then actually this forces me to have a lar a, a dense depth R minus one topological minor. Yes? So in a sense, if this algorithm gets stuck on a set where every vertex is sending a lot of paths back to Si, yes? Then this is because this set, from the set S, from the set Si, we can extract a dense depth R minus 1 topological minor, right? Is it clear that from this lemma we get this claim? Yes, and the algorithm works? Good. So we need to prove this, this lemma. And what is actually the intuition? Maybe, maybe it's good to pause for a minute and draw a picture. So here is my graph G. Yes? Here is my set S that should be blue. <coughs> and the idea is that every vertex inside here is sending a lot of these joint paths that are short back to S, right? This vertex is sending a lot, and this vertex is sending a lot, and this vertex is sending a lot, and so on and so on. Yes? So the intuition is that already you see a set S, yes, with a lot of connections to itself. From such a set, you should be able to construct a dense topological minor, yes, <laughs> because there is a lot of connection from S back to, to S. However, this is not so obvious from the Technically, because, well, if I have here a vertex and here another vertex, maybe this, say, this fountain that this vertex is sending is intersecting the fountain that is sent by the other, by the other vertices. Yeah, so we need to uncross those, those paths in order to really construct a dense topological minor. And this is what we are going to do. Yeah. Okay, so here, proof of the lemma. Good, so this is my set S. Uh, so maybe we can introduce some notation. Let um, this, um, so for this, for this 
fountains of those or spiders that are sent by, by every vertex, every vertex V has this family of paths PV. Yes, this is the family of paths that is sent back to S. Yes, and we have that the cardinality of PV is larger than L for every vertex V. Yes? Okay, so we want to try to construct a dense depth R minus 1 topological minor on S, right? That's the intuition. So let's do it, simply. So do it like a, uh, not really constructively, but uh, let's say declaratively. So let Q, Q be a maximal family of paths. Uh, of paths of the following kind. So first of all, each path from Q has length at most 2R minus 1. <coughs> so this is the length for depth R minus 1 topological minus, right? This is why I put 2R minus 1 here. Second, paths of Q Go uh, start and end in S, but are internally disjoint with S. And third, no two vertices of S are joined are connected by more than one path in Q. Oof, this was long, so let's run a picture. So what I'm actually doing here? This is my set S. I'm trying to pack as many disjoint paths from S to S as possible in order to get as dense as possible topological minor with S being the vertex set. Yes? So let me draw the first path. It starts from here, it goes outside of S, and maybe I can use a different color. It starts here, it goes outside of S, and it goes back to S. Yes? And then maybe I can find another path of length at most 2R minus 1 that starts here, goes outside, and goes back. And so on and so on. This path need to be drawn also on the middle, right? Yeah, yes, they should be. I did not, I did not write that they're disjoint. Ah, they are just internal disjoint with S and paths in Q, thank you. Paths in Q are internally revert existence. Yeah, of course. Meaning uh, we are trying to, to construct a topo depth R minus a topological minor. So the paths that we are using should be disjoint. Yes, yeah, so we're trying to. <coughs> Pack as many disjoint paths from S back to S, yes, mm -hmm. so that we construct as dense as as as, as possible uh, shallow topological minor. Yes, so the paths they can share endpoints in S. They cannot share vertices outside of S, but uh, there is no point in in drawing two paths connecting the same pair of vertices, right? Yeah, because these paths should uh, should represent them than edges in this. Yeah. So uh, the idea of this of this Q is that we would like to to construct a, a dense to topological minor of G. So let H be a graph on S where two vertices, say U V from S, are adjacent. 
if some path in Q connects them. Yeah? So this is nothing else than essentially this picture, yeah? Where I now interpret every path that goes outside as simply a, a single edge between these two vertices. Yes, I just draw F, an edge between two vertices of S whenever there's a path in Q that connects them. Yeah? So essentially from the definition, we've got that claim H is a depth R minus 1 topological minor of G. Yes? Because these paths exactly model the edges in H. Yeah? So if I have this, this means well, I'm proving the lemma by contradiction. Proof by contradiction. Yeah? This means that I can assume that the edge density of H, yes, is at most D. Right? Because this is an upper bound on the density of depth R minus 1 topological minors. Yeah? Now what is V of H? V of H is nothing else than simply the size of S. Yes? So this means that the number of vertices, the number of edges of H, which is exactly the same as the cardinality of Q, yes, is upper bounded by the size of S times uh, what? Times D. Yes? We cannot pack too many connections here. Yeah? And this is kind of easy because there are no dense topological minors. Good. So now what's the, what's the idea? Maybe I will redraw this picture a bit to make things more clear. Yes. So here I've got those connections from Q. Yes, maybe here is some connection, maybe here. I will not draw all of them, only a few. Yes. And now we've got those paths from the families PV. Yes, these fountains that or spiders that every vertex is sending back, back to V. Yeah? So let's draw it. Maybe this vertex is sending here a path, here a path, here a path, and maybe here a path. Yes? These paths from PV may of course intersect Q. Yeah? But let so so if I have some some path P from this family PV, let me construct P prime. Yes? This is um, this is P or prefix of P. up to the first hit of, let's say, S union, all the vertices of Q. Maybe you can uh, actually name it somehow. Maybe I can write name K. K is just the union of, the, of all the vertex sets of paths from Q. Yes, so this is the set of all the vertices that participate in all the paths uh, in all the paths from Q. Yes, so all the pink vertices on this picture, this is pink? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so what I'm doing now, I'm looking at the spider that each vertex is sending, yes, and I'm trimming every path to the first hit of either back the, the, the set S or any of the paths from family Q. Yes? So then we can define the trimmed spider. This will be just PV, uh, like P prime for all P in PV. Yeah? Good. So now what's the idea? Now comes the crucial claim. Um, I want to leave this.
Now comes the crucial thing. Say that I've got u and v. Ah, uh, OK. OK, this will not be yet the crucial claim. I need to do one more step. One more step is the following. I've got here this graph h. Yes? Graph h is 2D degenerate. Yeah, why? Well, edge density of H, as we have observed, is at most D, right? Because this is a depth R minus one shallow, uh, topo shallow topological minor. Yeah? And every subgraph of H is also a depth R minus one topological minor of, of the graph G. Yes? So every subgraph has edge density at most D, so it has a vertex of minimum degree of, of, of degree at most 2D. Yes? So this means that the graph H is 2D de de degenerate. Yeah? If graph G is 2D degenerate, this implies that H can be colored with 2D plus 1 colors. Has a proper coloring with 2D plus 1 colors. Right? It's just the greedy ordering. This was one of the exercises during the tutorials. Yeah? So this implies that H has an independent set I of size at least size of F over 2D plus 1. I just take the largest color class in the coloring. Yes? So essentially, graph H is sparse, and therefore it has a large independence. So now comes the crucial thing. So if I take two words, say u and v, from this independent set, what does it mean an independent set on this picture? This means a set of vertices that are pairwise not joined by those passed from q. Yes, this is an independent set in H. Yeah. If I take two vertices, u and v, from my, from my independent set, then I claim that paths in this trimmed, the trimmed spiders are pairwise internally disjoint. So on a picture, if I have my set S, yes, and here I've got my, say, U, and it sends some path here, it cannot happen that V sends the stream path, and they both intersect in here somewhere. Yeah? Why? Well, the proof is already here on the picture. If they intersected here before, before uh, reaching any of the paths from Q, then I could go from U to the intersection point, and then go from the intersection point to V, yes? And that, that would be a path of length at most actually something like r minus 1 plus r minus 1, so 2r minus 2, yeah, because uh, this, this is an internal vertex on both those paths, yes? That could be, could be added to q. So here we use the fact that q was chosen to be maximal. And here we also use the fact that u and v are from the independent set to say that there was no path between u and v already. Yeah, good. Okay, so now we have uh, those 
This means that those spiders that are sent by the vertex of the independence set are actually now disjoint. They form a system of disjoint paths. And many of them, because each of the vertices of the independence set sends a lot of them. Yeah? So now we can define our final topological minor, which will actually be uh, denser than it should be. Yeah? So the vertex set, so this will be defined graph j as follows. So the vertex set of j will be S union k. So the vertices of S, yes, and all the vertices on those paths from Q. Yeah? So first, let's estimate how many of them there are. So the size of the vertex set of J, this is at most the size of S union K. So uh, here somewhere there, we observed that the size of Q is at most D times the size of, uh, the size of S because of the density of the graph H. Yes? So this means that the size of S union K Okay, maybe the size of k is at most, well, uh, d times s. This is the number of edges, the number of paths that participate in q, times, well, 2r minus 2. Because on each of those paths from q, yes, I can see at most 2r minus 2 internal vertices. Mm -hmm. Yes? This is the estimation for the size of, of, of k. And I've got one more s, yes? So I can write size of s times d times 2r minus 2 plus 1. Let me round it up to something like that. Simply 2dr. Yes? Good. Okay, so now what are the edges? We put all edges given, I will write it as a shortcut, uh, by paths of P prime V for V belonging to my favorite independence. Yes, so each of those vertices from my independent set, say this vertex, yes, is sending his spider P prime V, P prime V, yes? And each of these paths here, they're of length R minus one, yes? Gives rise to a different edge, yes? Because these paths are disjoint, they hit S union K in different vertices, yes? So then the size of the edge set of G, of J, yes? is at least, well, it's at least the size of i, yes, the number of vertices of, of my independence set, and each of them sends more than L paths, yes, where L is the, is this number 6R d cube that we started with, yes? Mm -hmm. Now, i had still large size, so this is at least the size of S over uh, 2D plus 1 times L, yes? So maybe I'll round it again, 3D times L, yes? Uh, now maybe I can even uh, put it there, so this is simply size of S uh, times 2R D squared, yes? Okay, so we have estimated uh, from above the size of the vertex set of J and from below the size of the edge set. Yeah? So now what is the edge density of J? Well, it is larger than, let's just put down the numbers. Mm 
Now magic, this cancels out, all of this cancels out, and I end it up with D. And this is a problem because J is a depth R minus 1 topological minor of G. Yeah, because these paths model the connections. Yes, this path from PV, uh, P prime V, and we needed this claim, yes, to make sure that they are actually disjoint. Yes, that they do not cross, and therefore we got this, uh, this yeah. Yeah, so we have found a depth R minus 1 topological minor of G, whose density is larger than D. Than D. And this is what we were after. So this was quite a cunning proof, in a sense, because we sort of used the fact that we do not have uh, dense shallow minors twice. Once, when we constructed this, this greedy, this maximal set of paths, Q, yes, in order to reason that it is, that it is sparse, and second in the final argument, Q. Yeah? Okay, so that's a nice proof. And we have proved this lemma, and therefore we have proved this uh, this upper bound on the on the admissibility uh, numbers in in class of bound expansion. Are there any questions now for this proof? Yeah. So this uh, this finishes the. Um, the proof of this of this theorem there that uh, the general coloring numbers e exactly characterize class of bond expansion and now based on this proof and in particular on this lemma here that I have saved for future yes we are going to to prove some uh, really nice result that is actually quite a recent result in the sense that I now added it to the notes uh, it was not covered two years ago during this course because two years ago it was still a conjecture. So, when you look at this whole theory, there is one inconvenient thing. Namely, that if you have, say, a class of bounded expansion, bounded expansion, yes, and you've got some graph G from this class, yes, uh, it's the other way around, yes, if you have a, a graph G from this class, then from, for this graph G, you can produce one order, say sigma 1, for which the, its weak coloring number 1 is bounded by, say, W call of the class at depth 1. Yes. I can produce another ordering, sigma 2, for which W call 2 is bounded. Yes? I can produce another ordering sigma 3, and so on and so on. So for every radius, I can produce an ordering which has small weak coloring number. Right? But the construction of this ordering, as we as we essentially sketched here, this because the we construct this ordering by this admissibility and so on. This construction depends on the value of R, right? So a priori, those ordering sigma R can be different. Yeah? Maybe I've got one ordering that is good for the radius one, another ordering that is good for radius two, another ordering that is good for radius 3, and there are different orderings, yes? It would be nice to have one universal ordering that would be working for all the values of weak coloring numbers, for instance, yeah? So the question is, is there one universal ordering that simultaneously for all the values of R has bounded weak coloring numbers, let's say, yes? And this is indeed true, and this is what we will prove now. So theorem 
so C has bounded expansion. Yes, then there is a function. F, let's say, such that for every graph from my class, yes, there exists an ordering of G such that for every radius, the weak coloring number at depth R for this one fixed ordering is bound by, this fun by the function of r. Yes? So I can find one ordering that simultaneously is bounded for all the values of r. Yeah? Okay, so the proof. Uh, maybe before the proof, actually, and this is quite convenient that uh, I have a free board just next to this board. Yeah. Because we will need an amendment of this lemma that will be a little bit stronger. So maybe I will write it down and then we'll analyze it. So I've got again the same setting, GRD, yes? And I also have some parameter alpha from 0, 1. Yes? This is a positive real below 1. So again, in G, there is a set S such that. So here we assumed that every vertex of S is sending a, is sending a spider of large size back to S. Yes? So now I will have a relaxation such that at least alpha fraction of vertices of S are sending R have B R V S uh, larger than L. Yes. So I'm not now insisting that every vertex is sending a lot of paths, but a large fraction, alpha fraction. So alpha times this cardinality of S vertices are sending. And now how much they are sending L which now I, I will redefine as not 6rd cube, but 6rd cube times 1 over alpha. <coughs> so now I'm insisting that each vertex is sending more, 1 over alpha paths times the number of paths it was sending. So for instance, if alpha is half, then he will send twice as many paths. Yes? But I only insist that only an alpha fraction of vertices of S are doing that. Yes? Is it clear how, the, how it is amended? Yeah? And then the conclusion is, is the same. Then in G, there is a depth R minus 1 topological minor. of edge density larger than me. Yeah? And the proof, actually I will only give a sketch, is just to follow the proof that we did and just to do some trivial amendments. So essentially now, instead of every vertex of S sending a lot of paths, I've got some subset T, yes? T is the subset of those of those guys, of those uh, vertices from S, for which <coughs> I've got this. The RVS is larger than that. Yeah, so these are the guys that send a lot. Yeah, and then I have that the size of T is at least alpha times S. Yes? Okay, so So now what we did in our proof, we have found an independent set that had a fraction of 2d plus 1, yes, of the original size of s. So now I amend it by saying that, well, 
h defined in the same way as we did. Yeah, so we again pack this maximal set of paths, uh, this family Q, and so on. We call we have this graph h that is 2D degenerate. It can be colored with 2D plus one colors again. Yes. So now I've got an independent set i inside my set t that has five at least t over 2d plus 1. Yes? Instead of saying I take the largest color class, I take, I take the color class that has the most number of vertices of t. Yes? And therefore, if I have 2d plus 1 colors, yes, I take at least 1 over 2d plus 1 fraction of, of t. Yes? To my, yeah. And now, because of this, we can, we can have those spiders sent from the vertices of i. Yeah? So now in the final estimation, what we have, um, what can I erase? I think I can erase this intuition. In the fi when, when we finish the proof, we were estimating this, the number of edges of my, of my minor j. Yes? How we did it, we said that this is at least well, this is more than the size of my independent set times the number of paths that each of the spiders is sending. Yes? And now in the amended <coughs> version, I've got here size of t over 2d plus 1 times L. Yes? So now what I have, t. is at least alpha times the size of s. But in L, I'm sending more paths. Yes? I'm sending alpha inverse of alpha times 6d r cube. Yes? And the alphas cancel out. Yes? I can compensate sending more paths by sending more paths the fact that only Few, that fewer vertices are sending them. Yeah? So this is kind of an easy amendment of the, of the proof. Good. So now we can erase the original version and work with this version towards the proof of the, of the theorem about the existence of a universal order. So the idea is to construct this universal order similarly as we did before, namely we, we order the vertices from right to left. Yes? So first we choose Vn, then Vn minus 1, and so on and so on. So at any point of the construction, uh, I have already ordered, say, <coughs> Vi plus 1, Vi plus 2, up to Vn. Yes? And here I've got my blob s of vertices that are unordered so far, and I would like to understand which vertex I can put here as vi. Yes? So that simultaneously the one admissibility, two admissibility, three admissibility, and so on and so on will be always bounded. Yes? Because if I bound the admissibilities, I bound also the, uh, I have an upper bound on the weak coloring numbers. Yes? By the, the relation between them. So what's the idea? So let's look at the vertices with vertices B from S with, let's say, BR, VS, B1, VS, more than twice the number that we had before. Yes? Where, again, this D is this upper bound on the density of uh, of zero shallow minus. Yeah? So if I look at distance one, r equal to one, and I ask for the, this back connectivity being twice the number 
that we had before, how many vertices V like that I can have in my S? At most half, yeah? At most S over two such vertices. Mm, round it down, yes. But I will write it down like that. Yeah, it's also true. Okay, so let's look at distance two. Let's look at vertices from S with V two larger than six times two times D one cube, where D one cube is, is is like that. Yes. But now I will put here four. How many vertices of this kind I have? Yeah. Yes? Okay, so let's let's do it more generally. Let's look at VR VS. Let's look at this condition, 2 to the R times 6 times R times uh, Yeah? How many vertices of this condition I may have in my graph? Well, at most, um, S, over S over 2 to the R. Yes? OK, so I write these conditions up to R at most, uh, I think, log base 2 of the size of S. Yes? So then, the number of vertices that satisfy either this, or this, or this, and so on and so on, yes, is at most the sum of those numbers, yes? So the number of vertices, vertices satisfying, satisfying uh, that this BR of VS is at most 2 to the r times 6r times this funny number. Yeah? For all r at most log base 2 size of s. Yeah? How many are there? It's at least, well, all the vertices minus s over 2 minus s over 4 minus size of s over 8, minus, and so on, minus size of s over 2 to the floor of log size of s. Yes? If I remove half, I have half left. If I remove a quarter, I have a quarter left, and so on and so on. So at the end, I've got at least s over 2 to the floor of log s left, which is at least one vertex. Yeah? So I am left with at least one vertex that have good back connectivity for all R that is at most log size of S. Yeah? Good. So what about larger S? Actually, larger S are trivial. Why? Because if I've got R larger than log base 2 size of S, then if I look at any vertex V and I estimate its back connectivity, yes, then this, of course, is at most the size of S. I cannot put more paths than the cardinality of S. Yes, because each of those paths needs to finish and in a different vertex. Yeah. But this, well, this is the same as 2 power log base 2s, yes, which is upper bound by 2 to the r. Yeah? So I've got that this back connectivity is at most 2 to the r, which is even better than the bound that we had there. Yeah? So this, all of this implies that there is a vertex V from my set S, 
such that I've got this bound dr vs at most 2 to the r times 6r times this graph. Yes? For all r. Right? And I can choose it. Yes? And if I choose always such a vertex, then I will always have such an upper bound on the admissibility. Yes? So then we get ordering sigma with admissibility r of sigma at most this bound. for all are simultaneous. Yes? If now admissibilities are bounded, W calls are bounded, and I have proved this theorem. Yes? So this theorem starts here, goes there, goes back, and ends here. Yes? Is this proof clear? So this is a very cunning trick, yes, of, of saying that actually only half of the vertices will be bad for distance one, half of the remaining half will be bad for distance two, and so on and so on. Yeah, so you've got this geometric series ending up with one vertex being actually good. Yeah. There is also an alternative proof of this theorem uh, using some, uh, some gain interpretation. Uh, I'm not, I didn't really comprehend it so far, but I think that this, this is easy enough that, uh, that it, it, it can be memorized. Good. So this was the, the thing about, uh, about universal orders. So this essentially ends the, the, the topic of computing and, uh, of computing and the relations between general scholaring numbers and, and, um, and the density of shallow minors. And now we move to a different topic, namely applications of, of general scholaring numbers. And the first and foremost application is for the computation or rather approximation of independent sets and dominating sets in graphs. Okay. So let's start with some definition. First of all, you already know what is an independent set in a group. Yeah, this is a set of vertices that are pairwise non adjustment. Yeah, so this is like an independent set of distance one, because I want every two vertices to be at distance more than one. Right? So let's generalize. So I will say that if I've got a graph G and I've got some distance parameter, oh maybe R. R Yes, then a subset of vertices i is a distance r independent set in G, yes, if the distance between every two vertices is larger than r for all u, v in r. Yeah? So this is a proper generalization, yeah? Uh, distance one uh, independent sets are exactly independent sets in the classic sense. Yeah? But observe that even, like, we already know that sparse graphs contain large independent sets. But it is not necessarily true that every sparse graph contains a large two independent set, distance two independent set. What's the example? Star. A star, yeah? A star, you cannot pack two vertices at distance more than, uh, more than two from each other, yeah? Okay, so this, uh, this is the independent number. And okay, so for, for an integer r, by independent, independence number at distance r of g, this is the largest set uh, size 
of an of a distance r independent set in G. Yeah, so this is a parameter. I will call it like int r of G. Many people call it also alpha r of G because alpha of G is usually the independence number, the largest size of an independence. I prefer, prefer more descriptive uh, notation. So this is what we will use. Um, OK, so this was independence. Now the dual of independence is domination. So maybe you have uh, seen a definition of a dominating set in a graph. So a dominating set in a graph is a, is a vertex subset that dominates the whole graph, of course. And what does it mean to dominate? Every vertex is either taken to the dominating set or is a neighbor of a guy from a dominating set. So in a sense, every vertex from a dominating set dominates itself and all its neighbors. And everybody should be dominated. Yeah? So now we can generalize this because now we, I just said that every vertex is dominating itself and all its neighbors. So all the vertices at distance one. So let's say that if I've got a graph G and the radius R, I will say that D is a distance R dominating set in G if for every vertex U there exists a vertex V in D such that the distance between U and V is at most R. Yeah? Okay, so this is a generalization of the classic concept of a dominating. So let's look at these two definitions for a minute and let's, uh, let's think about them. So for independence, let's think about independence to R of G. I claim that the independence number at distance to R is the same as maximum number of balls of radius r that can be packed that can be disjointly packed in g yeah so by ball of radius r what I mean is that I need to pick one vertex, which is a center of a ball, say U, and the ball of radius R, say B, R of U, is just the set of all vertices which are at distance at most R. Yeah? So now I claim that the independence number 2R is just the packing number for those balls, yeah? Because and this is essentially trivial, if I've got a set of vertices that are at distance more than two R from each other, this is equivalent to saying that if I draw balls of radius R around them, then these balls should be disjoint. Yes? Yeah, because if the two if two balls were intersecting, this means that there would be a vertex simultaneous at distance r from one center and from r from the other center. <coughs> yes, and if the balls are not intersecting, then well, in order to go from one vertex to another, I need to travel r in one ball and travel r in the other ball. Good. So this is independence number for two r. So now I claim if I look, go to the world of dominating set at distance r, I claim that this is a covering number for balls of radius r. Yeah? So the minimum number of balls of radius r in a graph that I, can, that I may take in order to cover all the vertices. And this is just from the definition. Every vertex is is dominating ball of radius around uh, of, of radius r around it. So the domination number at distance r is the same as the no minimum number of balls I can take to 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 cover the whole graph. Yes, is it clear? 
But I claim that this is also the, and this is a funny duality, this is also the heating number for both of radius r. Yeah? So uh, by heating number, I mean the minimum number of vertices I can take in a graph, I'm, I, I need to take in a graph, in order to intersect every ball of radius r. Right? Because now, instead of drawing balls around vertices of the dominating set, let me draw vertices uh, balls around all the vertices of my graph. And now a vertex is dominated by somebody from the dominating set if this vertex from the dominating set hits, intersects the ball of this vertex. Yes? So if I've got here my graph, and here I've got a vertex that should be dominated, I draw a ball of radius r around it. And in order to dominate him, I need to pick somebody from this ball. Yes? Yeah. It's, just, it's just symbol pushing, meaning there is nothing inside. It's just a convenient way of, of looking at this. So if you now see packing number for balls and hitting number for balls, you start to think duality. Yeah. And indeed, so the trivial lemma is as follows that for every g, for every graph g, and for every radius r, yes, I've got the following uh, equation that the independence number at distance 2r of g is a lower bound for the domination number at distance r. And the proof is, is kind of trivial. If I have this number independence to RG disjoint R balls or this R ball, distance R balls in G, then we need at least this number vertices to hit them. Right? Because each ver because they are disjoint, when taking any vertex to the independent set, I hit at most one of those, of those balls. Yes? And I need to hit all of them. Yes? The hitting number is always at least the packing number. Yeah? You can rephrase it in the original terms by saying that let me look at the vertices of my distance to our independent set. And now, in a distance r dominating set, every vertex is dominating at most one of those. So I need to take at least as many to the dominating set as I have vertices in my distance to our independent set. Yeah? So now the usual question in combinatorics with such duality theorem between packing and 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 heating is whether you have also some kind of a weak uh, inequality in that direction. Namely, if actually the domination number could be uh, could be upper bounded from above also by some function of the packing number. Yes, that's a natural question. Yeah, whether these two things are actually somehow bound with each other. So in general, no. So during the tutorials, we see an example where this is constant and this is arbitrarily large. But it turns out that in sparse graphs, in particular in graph classes of bounded expansion, this is indeed true. And the theorem that we will prove during the next lecture is the following. Mm. So let's see be a class of bounded expansion. Yes. And then the following holds. Then for every graph G in my class and for every radius R, I've got the, the domination number of g at distance r, well, it is at least the independence number, 
to R of G. Yes. And this is upper bound, and I will now I will write it a little bit funnily. W call, and this turns 2R plus 1 of C squared times the independence number at distance 2R plus 1. Yes? Observe that actually the independence number at distance 2R plus 1 is upper bounded by the independence number at distance 2R. Yes? Because in order to pack both of radius 2R, yes? It's easier to pack both of radius 2R, uh, sorry, uh, to pack vertices at distance 2R from each other, more than 2R from each other than at distance 2R plus 1 from each other. Yes? So even with this factor here, I've got an, uh, an inequality with, with this. Yeah? So there is a linear gap, linear multiplicative gap between the domination number and the independence number at distance 2R. Yeah? Is this clear? Yeah. So in, in, in fact, in general graphs, there is no constant gap here. In sparse graphs, there is. And, uh, yes? Uh, where the wood color, uh, there is a G? Yeah. Uh, the, this is the, of the class. Oh, yeah. okay. Actually, I can write here even G. Okay. Yes, so, so that's the theorem that we will prove the, during the next lecture. And the fact is that this proof is algorithmic. The proof is algorithmic in the following sense that it gives constant factor approximations both for the domination number R and the independence number to R. Yeah? So the proof actually will give us a dominating set. Yeah? So the proof actually provides us a dominating set D and an independent set R, well, at certain distance, such that the size of D is at most this weak coloring number times the size of I. And then from this inequality, you can easily see, and we will do it uh, again in details uh, next week, that actually D is a this constant factor approximation of the optimum dominating set. So it is at most this times larger than the optimum distance R dominating set in your graph. And also I is a this factor approximation of the distance to R plus 1 independent set in your graph, in a sense that it's a, it is a distance to R plus 1 independent set in your graph of size at least the optimum over this factor. Yeah? So this is like a prime uh, algorithmic application of weak coloring numbers. So I hope that maybe I could do it today, but I don't think that I will manage in the remaining six minutes. Uh, so we will prove this theorem. This is a theorem of Bosch as many of the theorems that we are now showing. And you can, you can find it in the literature under this name. Um, we will start with this in the, um, in the next lecture, and then we will proceed to the next uh, applications, which will be the, the so-called neighborhood complex. OK, good. Then let me finish this lecture a little bit earlier, and we meet uh, quarter past two uh, for the tutorials. You can have the the the, the exercise for the tutorials already here.